Moloeli Mzant Africa, on June 16th, South Africa will mark Youth Day. But this year, under the shadow of the coronavirus pandemic, our nation faces a youth unemployment rate that has spiked up to almost 75%. This means that only one in four young people stand a chance of finding a job. Today, we unpack how we can put young people at the center of the agenda in our country. It is an absolute indictment that South Africa is ranked number one in the world for the highest youth unemployment rate. These are not just figures and statistics. These are lives. These are people who have been let down by our government in a spectacular fashion. But first, we take a look at the weekend headlines. ESCOM announced that it will cut electricity supplies nationwide until Friday after more breakdowns at some of its facilities. The power utility recently admitted that such interruptions are likely to persist for as long as the next five years. We have, as of this morning, laid criminal charges against Dr. Zulim Kize and the Director General of the Department of Health, Dr. Sandile Lebutelez. It's not only that irregularities have happened in this uh, contract, but actually Zuelim Kize should be held criminally liable for those irregularities. The Burger King buyout was blocked by the Competition Commission. There has been huge pushback. It was an unprecedented decision, as I said, by the Competition Commission. The DA is very concerned about the latest development in the process to amend Section 25 of the Constitution. The ANC all of a sudden tabled an amendment that would include custodianship to be added to the Constitution. Veteran actress Shalene Sechi Richards has died at the age of 66. She's a veteran, a celebrated, iconic figure that today we only not bereaved by it, but we celebrate the footprint of Shalene Sechi Richards in our lives. This week in the headlines, the DA continues the fight against the ANC and FF's attempts to rob South Africans of real ownership of their land and to make them permanent tenants of the state. The regressive gun legislation remains on the table and the DA lays criminal charges against Minister Mkhize. But first, with South Africa rapidly heading towards stage four rolling blackouts, load shedding remains a danger to South African lives and livelihoods. ESCOM is simply unable to repair and maintain power infrastructure to keep the lights on. And now with the third COVID-19 wave upon us, lives are at risk as South Africans struggle to keep life-saving oxygen machines going in the midst of rolling blackouts. The DA calls for urgent intervention by government to address this crisis. We need to free South Africa from the ESCOM monopoly once and for all. Last week, we laid criminal charges against Minister of Health Dr. Zuelim Kize and Health Director General Dr. Sandy Lebuteles. Both are implicated in a dodgy contract worth 150 million rand that was awarded to close associates of Minister Mkhize. These allegations are incredibly serious and undermine the trust that South Africans must have in our COVID-19 response. We had called on President Cyril Ramaphosa to prove that his tough man stance on corruption is more than just empty words by suspending Minister Mkhize until all investigations against him are concluded. Instead, he opted to place him on special leave, which is simply not good enough. For a country with a staggering unemployment rate, which condemns many people, especially black South Africans, to a life of poverty, this story should enrage us all. The Competition Commission has blocked the sale of Burger King in South Africa, citing that the purchaser did not meet BE targets. These actions do very little to truly empower black South Africans. Instead, they just enrich a select few, while still repelling foreign investment that is so desperately needed to create thousands of jobs for people. The ANC's obsession with racial bean counting is damaging and will result in no economic reforms. Just more people joining the unemployment queue. President Cyril Ramaphosa stated last week that he believes it is up to the courts to decide if South Africans would be allowed to apply for firearm licenses for, fire, for self-defense. This statement is a clear lack of confidence by the president in the gun bill. 
The ANC must make their views heard and clear on this matter so that the public can hold them account for their attempt to take away their constitutional rights to protect themselves and their families. The DA calls on the President and Minister Kile to shoot the Straconian gun bill down. Add your voice to our petition to protect your rights at stopgunbill.co.za. It became clear last week that the ANC and the EFF are conspiring to nationalize land in South Africa. The ANC is so desperate to get a two-thirds majority needed in Parliament to change the constitution and to allow for expropriation of land without compensation. They've asked for more time to make a deal with their partners in crime, the EFF, and to pull off a land heist of epic proportions. What makes matters worse is the ongoing attempt by the ANC and the EFF to exclude or minimize the role of the courts in adjudicating land expropriation cases. We stand ready to stop this and to uphold our constitution and our Bill of Rights. We will not allow the ANC EFF coalition of corruption to condemn South Africans to permanent tenancy. And finally, the DA was saddened to learn of the passing of icon Charlene Surti Richards. She was not only an incredible actor, but a national treasure. Her talent transcended audiences across the nation. She was a groundbreaking performer who paved the way for so many upcoming and established performers today. There will never be another Charlene. In the spotlight this week, South Africa's youth face a bleak future as almost 75% of them face a life with no dignified employment. Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. Youth unemployment in South Africa takes centre stage as the country marks 45 years since the June 16, 1976 student uprising. The country's unemployment rate has reached a new high. According to Statistics South Africa, the youth accounts for the majority of that figure. Many millions of unemployed young people as well who will have little to celebrate on June 16. Youth unemployment under the expanded definition is a staggering 74.7%. 3.3 million of them are not in employment, not in education or training. That needs some serious fixing, doesn't it? Everything flows once you start to create jobs. If, you, if you're worried about inequality, if you're worried about health care, if you're worried about tax collection, all of that requires employment in order to improve that. I went to school, I passed metric, I graduated from a college, but there are no jobs. Being employed, getting bursaries, getting whatsoever, it's rare for us. Hence, we are stuck here. The government must try something because most of the people are about to die. This is not the best time to be a young person in South Africa, is it? In many respects, it is now a survival game. of South Africa's population are under the age of 35 years old. Today, our nation's youth are facing the biggest crisis in South Africa's democratic history. Millions of young people between the ages of 16 and 35 are at the risk of never working their entire lives, or if they do, they run the risk of working their entire lives without the possibility of improving their socioeconomic status. This is not the South Africa that the youth of 76 so bravely fought for. Those young people fought for an equal South Africa, which would see them have access to quality education and ultimately dignity for them and generations to come against the apartheid government. And today, the struggle could not be more urgent or life-defining. Our nation is ranked number one in the world for the highest youth unemployment rate, where only one in four young people stand a chance of finding a job. And at the helm, we have an ANC government that neither knows how nor possesses the political will to yank us out of this crisis. This government's policies are aimed at enriching the politically connected, allowing for grand theft of public money, and in so doing, are killing jobs. The country needs a plan to rescue our economy and to create jobs and to rescue us from the albatross that is the ANC around our collective necks. 
To discuss all of this and more, we are joined in studio by Dear Youth Western Cape Metro Regional Chairperson Tammy Jackson and a young South African who uh, has had experiences of youth unemployment, Avon Blackies. And on Zoom, we are joined by the MMC for Roads and Transport in the city of Twanet, Digele de Siloa, and Dear Youth Leader, Loyolo Mbiti. Good morning, guys, and thank you so much for joining us. And I want to jump straight to you, Loyolo. Uh, I want you to essentially point, paint a picture for us uh, about what these numbers mean. I think for often we talk about 75%, one in four. What do these things mean in reality? We've seen youth unemployment at the highest that it's ever been. What does this mean in reality from a policy point of view, but also from a lived experience point of view? Thank you so much, Steve, and a very good morning to your listeners. I think members of the youth of 1976, who out of turmoil found the strength to be able to fight off uh, something that was very difficult and trying at that time. And it is that spirit, it is that power, it is that, that feeling of being able to conquer and fight a system that the young people today in South Africa require. And to then go into the question about the profile of young South Africans right now in this country, three in four young people are unemployed in this country. The profile is simple. Those are young people on street corners, emergents who are just chilling, not knowing what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are young people who are on the internet looking for jobs day in and day out. Young people buying newspapers, trying to find something. Those are young people who have no hope, who've lost hope. In fact, who are now depressed because mm -hmm we are now seeing the highest level of mental illness in this country and that issue is facing young people. We are the ones depressed. We are depressed because we live in a government that is unable to see us, unable to see the experiences that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the lack of dignity that we have as young people in this country, not able to find a job, that you even go to university and you graduate but you still can't find a job. Where is the dignity? in this yeah. government. We have the dignity that is failing to see young people in this country. So we are beyond past in your windows of the ANC in South Africa. As young people, we are calling out for more work to be done by this government. We don't, know, we don't want to be grant dependent. Mm. We're not a generation that is going to be grant dependent. We're a generation that knows what we want. We just want facilitation from the government in terms of this economy, put us at the center of this con economy, we are no longer willing to be at the periphery of the of the issues that we are facing in this country. So as the DA, those young people that you are speaking about, Sivira, that the insert has spoken about, those three and four unemployed young people in this country, we see them as the DA. And that is our fight each and every day. And I'm glad that we have such an incredible panel here today, um, like the Galeri Soloa, who, you know, in 2012, this is what we were fighting about. And fast forward a few years later, 2021, we are still fighting the same case. So something's got to give uh, today, not tomorrow. We need something to give. Yeah. Tell me, Loyola, I, I, I do want to have a quick follow up with you. I mean, I also do find it incredibly um, important to note how there's there's a disconnect between the people who are policy makers and who are trying to, who are making decisions about young people and versus a young country um, that has the average, the continent has an average age of 19 years old. But you see a massive disconnect between those who are making these policies and those on the ground. And do you think that this has an impact on how and the policies which are being propelled from a government point of view? Definitely. We, we have officials, we have politicians, we have ministers and deputy ministers and the president who himself who is failing to understand the experiences on the ground. When you drive on a day-to-day -day basis, who's on the side of the street? Mm. You know, when you, when you go to an internet cafe, who are the people sitting in those chairs trying to Google jobs, trying to find out where can I get my next break? When you go to businesses and you drive around and you see businesses closed, many of those businesses are young people who actually try to make an attempt to, to improve their lives, to improve the lives of, of their families. And so uh, a huge part of 
of South Africa's problem is that we have structural unemployment, um, meaning that we are, we are unable to link the adequate skills that our economy needs five to 10 years from now to the current generation that is sitting unemployed. So our generation and the skills that we have is not speaking to the economic climate that we are moving into as a country. Mm. And because we are not able to address that and we don't have a government that is able to understand these experiences and understand that young people don't want to collect grants at the end of the month. We want to be, we want to innovate. We want to create. We want to start our own businesses. But we don't want to just be given things on a silver platter. We want to be able to make those issues happen. So we have an issue with government and officials that do not know what is happening on the ground. And it's time now that if you do not know, move aside, allow us to come and show you, mm. partner with us so that we can show you what needs to be done. Yeah. Tammy, I want to bring you in here. I mean, Luyolo uh, uh, speaks about, um, you know, structural unemployment and what the and, and what the issues are. Um, I know that in, in, in Cape Town, for instance, whereas other metros completely shared jobs um, and yet, yet we were the only metro in the country who was able to create about 20,000 new jobs. Why is that the case and what is currently happening in the city of Cape Town? Viewer, I think that there is a lot to say about the city of Cape Town's ability to actually foster an environment that is conducive to business growth and thus creating more employment, not only for young people, but people generally, mm. but also coupled to the fact that the city of Cape Town is an incredibly attractive destination for investment. And so without getting into the details and technicalities of all of that, I think it's important to say that there's so many young people in our region who has been able to derive uh, benefits from these uh, uh, employment opportunities. And this is mostly as a result of the city of Cape Town's hands-on approach mm. when it comes to job creation. And so there's a number of flagship projects and initiatives that the city of Cape Town has launched uh, this year. Um, and one of them, is the Jobs Connect program, yeah. for example, yeah. which I'm sure all of you or people heard of. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, I would encourage you to please go and read up about it. And this project essentially aims to close the gap or connect rather, that's why it's called Jobs Connect, mm -hmm. uh, the employment sector and businesses that are looking to source talent and connect them to people who are employable, but unfortunately have been unable to make themselves attractive to companies. And so the Jobs Connect program essentially aims to address that issue. Another important uh, uh, thing to note is the fact that the city of Cape Town has a booming call center industry mm -hmm. right now which roughly employs about 60,000 people exactly. between the ages of 18 and 35 years old. Earlier this year, it was also said that this sector um, is also going to crea create another further 3,000 jobs or more mm. for that same age group of people between the ages of 18 and 35 years old. Um, and so, you know, this is it's going to give people a sense of financial stability for the next three years. And I think that's one of the reasons why the DA places such a massive emphasis on job creation, mm. you know. It's not about just having a job for the sake of having a job. It's about actually giving dignity to individuals. And what happens when individuals have uh, dignity, they are empowered, and you empower the household yeah. uh, as an extension of that. Tell me, I mean, uh, tell me, a lot of people might say, well, you know, the DA is constantly is on the side of big business, of the private sector, um, you know, and you know, for some reason, you know, that gets us attacked quite a bit. I mean, what would you say to people like that when it comes to actually creating jobs because you know when everybody else was shedding jobs we were creating jobs and so what is what is the connection between looking after private business interests and actually giving getting people dignity so i think there's a common misconception among the electorate where we often say that it's the job of the government or the state to create jobs mm. i'd like to state quite frankly today on the show, that that is not the case. Mm. It is the job of businesses and the private sector to create jobs, mm. right? And it is the duty of the state to create environments that are conducive for the growth of those type of sectors. And that means actually enacting policies and legislation that's gonna make it easier. And so businesses in the private sector, it's absolutely crucial uh, when it comes to creating jobs. And so I think that the city of Cape Town is a prime example 
um, of, of exactly yeah. what I'm mentioning. Yeah. Look at the fact that even the German government last year uh, gave the city, provided the city of Cape Town uh, with COVID relief funds worth 100 million rand, instead of actually giving it to the South African government mm. directly, mm. What, does it, what does this tell you? It means that foreign governments trust the city of Cape Town municipality more than what it actually trusts the South African government yeah. because they've seen we've been able to actually get things done. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone, I want to come to you. I mean, you know, we hear all of these stats. We hear about 75% of young people unemployed, one in four can only get a job. I mean, I mean, these, are, these sound like numbers, yeah. but behind these numbers are people, are people's lives. And I know you have a personal experience of this, and I want you to talk to us about your story. Sibiru, thanks for having me, and thanks for having me on your show. Um, those numbers have become names, and it becomes quite personal because my name is part of those stats. Mm. Um, my story is no different to any other young South African um, being in the prime of my life having done all the right things, going to school, um, going to college, mm. doing what you're supposed to do, doing the right thing, and at the end of that, the result into unemployment. It messes with your dignity as a young person, your mental health, having to sit there, personally having to go to a job. I saw somebody made a status saying that finding a job is a job on its own. Yeah. And, and the, the, the traveling cost, just simple mere basics that we are talking about is, when I just walk down my road, I see young people sitting on the street corners, and. I've become now one of them when I've done absolutely nothing to deserve that as a South African. And it's quite personal to me mm -hmm. because what have I done to deserve this as a young South African? People is attempting to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Friend of mine where I lived committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Unable to find employment. Your dignity is stripped away from you as a young South African. And that is not the youth of 1976 mm -hmm. that fought for the freedoms and liberation of young people in South Africa. Yeah. And I'm very disappointed from our policymakers that is less South African African young people right now, unemployed. It's not just a figure of seven, almost no. 75%. My name is part of that, and I've done absolutely nothing to deserve that. Absolutely. And that is quite personal to me. No, and of course, and as you say, you know, yours is a story of millions of other young South Africans who too are on the same boat. Yeah. And again, I mean, we look to policymakers and people who have been elected to create environments or at least to legislate so that we can get out, out, out of this crisis. Absolutely. Listen, I want to cross over to, to Digeledi now. Digeledi is our MMC in the city of Tswane for roads and transport. She's one of the youngest members of the city executive. And uh, Digeledi, uh, you know, as a young person, when you hear about statistics like this, again, you know, here's everyone talking about his personal experience. I think all of us in this room know, I mean, either personally or through, you know, other people know what the reality of joblessness looks like. And what, in your view, is some of the things that government should be doing as somebody who is in government currently? Thanks, Sibiwe. And I think the most important thing is to start off with what we are doing in the city of Tane and initiating. And obviously, it's getting young people to get free bus rides to actually go look for employment. So setting up and reigniting that program so that it doesn't cost a young person to actually find a job. As everyone had said, it's actually very costly to get a job. On its own, it is a job. And that is the first aspect of it. And then with economic development, what we are actually doing is we're looking for very disruptive ideas of young people in business who need the connections into industry, into the international market, and setting them up and having our first startup hub. So for young people who are actually looking into having startups and hitting the market, mm. and then you'd ask yourself, they're already established. And by being established, it means your level entry entrepreneurs, where do they go? And coming from roads and transport, it's actually using my taxi ranks and flipping them into night markets, sure. bringing investment to, to young people and having them set up those spaces and business coming and actually getting to see what young people are willing to sell and what young people are into. But it's also finding a good way to use space, targeting youth unemployment, giving them the free space to use in the evenings, depending on when taxi operations end, and having that space for them without actually costing them besides getting their goods to the premises and back home and ensuring that 
at least once we've built up enough capacity and enough interest, then we can start charging them. But it's creating the spaces in where young people can actually benefit from and actually tackle unemployment. And it also even goes down to the EPWP program in the city of Tswane that doesn't look at somebody just being a street sweeper, but mm. looks at giving people actual skills to go into the job market and say that they've got a certificate at the end of the program where they have a skill that is actually needed. Yeah, but Digaledi, it seems to me, and this is where the, my huge frustration, you know, comes in. It seems to me governments almost need to have the will to want to do it because it seems to me that, you know, unless you are targeting interventions like you are where you know you're saying let's create taxi ranks and make them hubs for young people to showcase their work let's make sure that young people are prioritized unless a government actually has a program of action it's never going to happen i think the reality of the matter is that the DA has gotten it right by having young people in government not only as public representatives but as legislation makers. And that is where it's important because at the point of time you look at, there are so many people who as young people don't have access into those spaces. But the minute you put young people there, they have the initiative, they have the drive, they also have an understanding yeah. of what it is that young people want and a culture. And they can always remind policymakers that you're not talking to the generation of 1976 that had different issues. You're talking to a new generation, Generation X. You're talking to young people who don't want to be stagnant, who want to move. And because of that is where you will actually find the will. So I think it's also an investment in our human capital yeah. to actually ensure that are receiving the most from the necessary policy changes we need to make. Yeah. Now, Tigeledi, I mean, we have a local government election coming right up in, in, in October. Young people sitting at home saying, you know, as everyone said, I'm one of those people. I don't have a job and I've done nothing wrong. What can people like that do? I mean, what you know, what's the expectation on me? I want to change the situation, but I'm unemployed and I've done nothing to deserve this. And so, you know, what what should people what should young people look out for in a government when they're choosing, when they're going into that ballot box, what should they do? I think the most important thing is for young people to vote for economy that they deserve and mm. an economy that they want, which is so essential. And in so doing is actually understanding the role of local government and what local government is supposed to do. And our job is to create a financially sustainable municipalities that can create an environment where jobs can be created by ensuring that private and business investment keeps increasing in that um, municipality and ensuring that with that investment, there are more jobs. You look at the automobile um, industry that is booming in the city of Tswane. And it's also because the city of Tswane is now looking at how can we use our airport to actually have cargo um, as well coming into the city without mm. having to go all the major airports, but you're also it's about creating industries and spaces within the economy of a city to actually ensure that there's an attraction. And that also goes down to infrastructure development. The more infrastructure you develop, um, it also creates jobs for young people, skills transfer, but as well, it comes down to ensuring that young people are not left on the wayside um, when it comes to actually participating. And a well-run city also makes a city more yeah. affordable. Yeah. So for young people who want to start their own businesses, want to start their families and um, be able to get affordable housing. When a municipality is run well, it actually makes it so much more affordable that they don't feel that they have to bend their back backwards to actually make ends meet. Yeah. And they can actually put more for them and room to explore other avenues of creating an income. No, absolutely. But I want to, um, Tammy and and Avron, I want to 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 follow up on this top uh, on this issue that I've just asked Digger Lady now. I mean, a local government election is coming up now in October, and young people have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to change the way that things are done. 
I personally am frustrated because very little changes. Instead, we get more and more people on the unemployment queues. I mean, what should be young people be doing and what kind of you know, drive should they be going to having? Or, you know, what, what would you say to young people about the local government elections when people say, well, you know, whatever, I don't have to go anywhere? I, th I think before we can even begin to talk about the local government election, I think it's important that people first, you know, come to the harsh realisation that the type of solutions that we are looking for to the problems that we face is not just going to fall from the sky and it's not going to come from this government to lead us here in the first place. And so the ballot box or the ballot paper is the most effective way for you to actually show your dissatisfaction with the status quo. Choosing to ignore that and choosing to remain ignorant won't bring any changes to our lives. Mm. And so I think young people really need to start being a bit more intentional yeah. about their existence and their participation within our country's democracy because that 75% youth unemployment rate that Loyolo spoke about earlier on is enough reason for us to have a total revolution in this country. Mm. And as and a liberal... Have, and, and we would have the numbers, right? Absolutely, absolutely we would. Mm. But as a liberal, I do not wish to see violence. Mm. But... I think at this rate, with the ANC still in power, we are slowly but surely heading into that uh, yeah. direction if nothing happens. Yeah. And we can start a revolution at the ballot box though, Tammy. I mean, people can say, can, they can come out in their numbers and they can say, we've had enough. Absolutely, but like I said, first we really need to come to that realization that that is what the solution is. And I think at this point in time, there's still thousands, not uh, probably millions of young South Africans who remain apathetic mm -hmm. about this issue. And I think, you know, for young activists like ourselves, it's our duty to actually make sure that we get out into the streets and we sign up young people uh, uh, to register to vote so that we can actually show that enough is enough. Yeah. Everyone, I mean, I want to bring you in here. What must young people do? Now more than ever, this election is as important as in 1994, the mm. first democratic election that we have. Now more than ever, young people have a chance to raise their voice, to not just be keyboard activists, but now actively go yeah, to that ballot I box. Like and that. as Tamir said, show your dissatisfaction with the government and vote where there is hope. Yeah. And that hope is a democratic alliance. Yeah. With the lowest unemployment rate in South Africa, this is not numbers that they are making up. Mm -hmm. And now more than ever, even this June 16 is as important as the one we had in 1976. Mm -hmm. This is the most, the, this is the critical moment where we take back our future. And that future is marked with, on the ballot box. Yeah. And yeah. that's as important as it is. And every young South African, if you are able to vote, please get out there. You can hear my voice watching us from wherever you are. Now more than ever is your chance to show your dissatisfaction and take back your future at the ballot box. Yeah. Come 27th of October, show this government your dissatisfaction being unemployed because right now is the prime of your life. And right now, you have the ability to take back your future come 27th of October. Yeah, no, absolutely. Loyola, I want to bring you in here again. I mean, here we are talking about and we, we I mean, we're getting passionate because, of course, you know, I, I do believe that the situation is not hopeless um, and that things can change. But, you know, there's there's some action that is required from young people in the country. I mean, what would you say to young people who say, well, Loyola, I mean, we've heard all of these things before. What would you do? differently and why should we trust you when we go to that ballot box thanks if you were and I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear you know the words that are being shared uh, there by your panel in studio i think this is exactly the mindset that this generation is having because we are getting sick and tired of listening to speeches we are getting sick and tired of talking about youth unemployment we are sick and tired of reading about it we we want action and this is why the DA um, is the best place and the best political party to take us in that direction. And Sivio, you've already said it. We have the lowest unemployment rate in the Western Cape right now in the country. Hmm. I mean, that is something that the DA actually gets things done. And simply put, our plan is, is quite simple. We have spoken about the employment tax incentive where we've said we want to re-stimulate re uh, the relationship between private business and creating skills for young people. You'll remember I spoke about the issue of structural employment, unemployment mm. in this country. 
um, we need to start giving young people those skills. And the only way we can do it is bringing in the private sector and partnering up with them to re-stimulate uh, the skills gap that exists in our country. Um, where we say that government must pay these businesses that employ and give young people internships and learnerships tax rebates for their businesses. So you get a benefit for employing young people between the ages of 18 to 29 yeah. um, and helping our country and helping this generation to actually become more economically viable and economically uh, accessible in terms of where the economy is going in this country. We've also said countless times, we need to start looking at different sectors in this country. There are sectors in this country that are dying out um, for, for multiple reasons. You look at mining in this country dying out. We saw uh, a major, major uh, companies leave the country uh, not, not so long ago in these past couple of years. So what we are saying is, where are the new sectors going in the next 20 years in this country? How are we looking at the green economy, um, the farming of hemp, the creation of oils through hemp, uh, agriculture um, as a means of growing young people people and giving them new access to, to markets that they've never been in. We mm. talk about the blue economy, our oceans. Um, there's never talk about how we are linking young people to the benefit of our oceans um, and the industry of oceans in this country. What are the market linkages to link young people to those sectors? Because those are the sectors, Sivira, that are taking our generation and will take this generation to a new economic, new economic time for this country. And so we are talking about innovative ways. And lastly, just to also speak about the informal sector. Yeah. We saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many young people who actually have informal businesses in this country were left out because they did not have a three-month bank statement. They did not have a registration with the CIPC for their businesses. And many of these young people did not benefit from the COVID relief funds that were accessible at that time, resulting in many of these businesses closing. So the DA has a plan for mm. informal businesses this country. We want to get databases so that we know where these informal businesses are. And we know that the ultimate goal is to formalize informal businesses because that's where you can actually open up these businesses for more opportunities, uh, be able to benefit from grant systems, funding opportunities that are available um, throughout government departments. Um, and so we need to start looking at different things. We cannot start, we cannot continue doing the same things yeah. over and over again and expecting different results. So what we are saying as the DA is that we do understand that there is a problem. We've proven it in the Western Cape that we can lower unemployment and it can be the lowest in this entire country. We've proven it in Midvale where we've given young people opportunities. And when you look at the, the employment rate in the Midvale, you will see how great we are doing. So we are saying the proof is in the pudding. We've yeah. shown you, give us an opportunity on the 27th of October, give the DA an opportunity to show you as a young person that we do see you, we do see your struggle, but but not only that, we have a plan, we have a solution to get you off the street, to get you out of that internet cafe, to get that business plan in your mind activated. We yeah. have a plan. And we, and we have demonstrated that we are able to get things done. And where we govern, we are able to get this done. And I personally, guys, I, I personally want us to rid ourselves of the literal shackle that is, you know, the, the ANC. Because if they clearly don't have a plan, we have a plan. And if young people want a government that will work for them, they need to vote differently. It literally is that simple. Because clearly we've been giving people chances where what they'll do is they'll invest in an NYDA that is literally a, a cater deployment school, whereas they would, should be using that money to plow back into, um, to, into young people. No, absolutely, Saviri. I agree with you. But I think you know, there really needs to be a political awakening yeah. among our youth. And we need to stop taking pride in our ignorance. Like I said before, people need to realize that at the end of the day, uh, we need to start uh, being more active in civil society. If we choose to, not only civil society, but politics generally, mm. when we choose to ignore these things, we allow politicians and people within the ANC to actually determine our futures for us. And yeah. we're running out of time. We no longer have the luxury of no. time. No. Everyone, I mean, you know, again, Luolo speaks about a number of things here that we're doing. We're getting things done in, in, in DA governments. Why have you gone behind the DA? 
The DA has been tested and the DA has proven that they've got what it takes to govern and govern properly. Where the DA governs, the DA governs well. The lowest unemployment rate in South Africa, the most sustainable financial stable metro in South Africa. These are not things that we have made up. Yeah. These are not figures that we've sucked from our thumb. These are actual independent institutions regulating and checking that the DA government has proven themselves. Independent institutions? Independent institutions. Mm -hmm. and. Amazon comes to Cape Town, South Africa. Why? Yeah. Best service delivery yeah. in the country. This yeah. is not stuff that we make up. Yeah. So many international investments coming to Cape Town, South Africa. That means job creation. That means light at the end of this tunnel in Cape Town, South Africa. Huge influx into Cape Town. Why? Cape Town delivers. Mm -hmm. And so the DA-led government is not just a government that talks about policy, yeah. but creates policy that creates opportunity for all. Yeah. Um, there was just a simple situation where I wanted to cut my hair and my mother let me know that this, it's load shedding. You can't cut your hair. Mm. But I was exempted from that because the city of Cape Town yeah. exempted everyone. For, and, and that's one of the simple basic things for me mm. that I've access to services that benefits me as a young person in Cape Town. And so come 27th of October, a week before my birthday, mm. please do go to that ballot box yeah. and vote for the Democratic Alliance. Yeah, and and Digaledi, people often say, you know, the DA's flagship is the Western Cape, is the city of Cape Town, but we're showing when we govern elsewhere that we are able to bring about the change that we talk about here. And I mean, what are your parting shots to young people about what they need to do as, you know, we, as we wrap up the segment about this crisis? I think what is so important for us to do is for young people to realize with the unemployment rate as it is, we are a few percentages away from a distinction and not achieving. And mm. that is the reality. And we need to also look across board. As I say, young people need to vote for the economy they want. And it's a, when we've got the track record in Swane, in the Midvale, in the city of Cape Town, in Port Elizabeth, that we run our municipalities better. Vote for a municipality that will deliver because a municipality that is able to deliver gives you an economy that you as a young person can thrive in. And that is the only way we can actually target youth unemployment. Absolutely. And I personally want to urge young people, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm slowly leaving the, the youth uh, category soon. <laughs> I don't want to be part of the ANC Youth League uh, crowd of youth in Dala. But, <laughs> but I, I, do want, I do want to urge young people to lend us your votes. What could you possibly have to lose? except you've, you could potentially lose a government that's been tanking us for 27 years. We'll be back after this. cities across the country. DA Tswane Mayor Randall Williams plants a hundred spec boom in the city. DA governed Western Cape ramps up vaccination sites and rollout. Register to get your jab now. And DA governed Cape Town hands over a hundred title deeds in West Bank to proud new homeowners. On to this week's Dear at Work feature, in February, the quarterly Labour Force Survey revealed encouraging early signs of economic recovery in the Western Cape. We created 121,000 new jobs in the last quarter, the highest increase of all the provinces in South Africa. To unpack how this has been made possible, we are joined by Ricardo McKenzie, a member of the provincial legislature in the DA run Western Cape. Uh, 
Alcott, and thank you so much for joining us. We've been uh, talking a lot um, just before uh, the segment. We've been talking a lot about how the DA gets things done and how we've got the lowest unemployment rate in the, in, in the country as a province. I mean, why is this the case? I mean, are we doctoring the numbers? What's going on? Good morning, uh, everyone, and good morning, Sibuya. Uh, we are definitely not doctoring the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> the DA does have the lowest unemployment rate in the mm. country uh, simply because we create the right environment for job creation. Mm. And it's something we've done consistently since we've been in government in the Western Cape uh, for provincial government since 20, uh, 2009 and the city of Cape Town since 2006. Mm. And w I mean, what is it about, what are we prioritizing as a government that really makes sure that we're an attractive uh, a destination for, for businesses to, 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 to invest in and then by creating jobs? Well, the, the first thing we do is we govern right. Yes. That's the first thing we do. Yes. We know how to govern. Mm. As a government, our job is not to create jobs, mm. but our job is to create the right framework to create jobs. And that's something we've done consistently right. Uh, something, uh, a sector that we've targeted specifically was the BPO sector. Okay. I mean, the last year during a What's global a pandemic, there's a business processing outsourcing, oh, okay. so also known as a call center okay. industry. Okay. Uh, during a global pandemic, we created 20% year-on-year uh, -year increase last year sure. on job creation, simply because we invested in that sector. Uh, I mean, last year alone, we invested over 38 million rand towards the job training of that BPO sector. That's For the crazy. next financial year, we've budgeted 99 million rand. Sure. To put it in perspective, for example, in Mitchell's Plain, which is hmm. my constituency, okay. through uh, our partners there, the private sector, through our regulations, through working with them, they've invested in fiber. Now that the fiber is there, they've opened a call center in Mitchell's Plain. Yeah, so we exactly. created that environment and business have invested in Mitchell's Plain. Yeah. And, and that's how we as a government created the, the, the regulations around call center, invested in uh, the physical infrastructure, the maintenance of the roads in Mitchell's Plain, mm. and our business have invested money in Mitchell's Plain. That is our role as government and business just come exactly. to the party. So it seems that if you govern and you govern well, then you also become an attractive destination for people to come and invest. And by investing, then they, by extension, essentially invest in your people and the communities around there. That's exactly what they've done. Mm. And if I look at what has happened during the pandemic last year, during the pandemic, many small businesses faces a terrible situation. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of May of last year, the Western Cape government, they said, hey, what do we do about the tourist businesses? Mm. I mean, tour guides were out of jobs. Through our uh, uh, contact call center, we've registered 5,000 tour guides last year and helped them to register so they could apply for the Tourism Development Fund. Through that, we've taken five million rand, invested five million rand okay. to enable them to survive during. Because sometimes people uh, just say we must create jobs, we must create jobs. Yeah. But remember, we have to stop jobs from being lost. Absolutely. And that is what this Western Cape government has done as well. And in fact, we've got a graphic um, that I want to just pull up, Ricardo. We essentially, we're showing exactly that, you know, as the Western Cape, we have the lowest, um, you know, unemployment rate in the country. I mean, if you look at just the, the Eastern Cape alone, um, right at the top, and Limpopo, Mpumalanga, the Northwest, and you go all the way down and you look at where we are um, as, as the Western Cape government, I mean, it, it proves exactly what you were saying. Yeah. It proves exactly what we were saying uh, uh, since last year. Mm. I mean, if you look at that number, uh, the expanded uh, definition of unemployment, yeah. I mean, compared to other provinces, I mean, it is amazing what the government has done, mm. not only throughout the last year, but during the global pandemic. When the pandemic hit us last year, yeah. uh, uh, the Ministry of Economic uh, Development and Small Business thought, what could they do? And they've come up with a, 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 a not only with a contact center, but through all their programs, they thought small businesses were going to be the hardest hit. Yeah. Somebody talked earlier about small businesses. They then said, how do we stop small businesses, not only from shedding job, but from creating job? They then allocated 40 million rand to 249 small businesses, mm. not only to help them stop jobs, but to help them at creating jobs. Mm. Not only that, in the Western Cape government, we spent about 2 billion rand on PPE last year. 
of that PPE, 971 million rand. That's 47 percent of that went to small and medium enterprises. Hectic. Compared to that, the national average is 30 yeah. percent. So that's how the Western Cape government has yeah. not only helped create jobs, but stop jobs from being lost. Instead of stealing PPE money, we made sure that we're investing it within small businesses. And that is so important to you. I'm very privileged that the, the, the committee that I chair mm. got oversight over the Western Cape government. Yes. And if you look at the SIU report on corruption that they released, yeah. out of the completed investigations of 36 investigations mm. into PPE corruption in the Western Cape. They completed 36 investigations mm. to the value of 184 million rand. And there was zero corruption to the SIEU. That is the difference between yeah. the Western Cape. Yeah. The only municipality they have fingered was the Matsikama municipality, which is, which is governed a, by, by the, the ANC, of course. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so yeah. so yeah. not only have we invested in small businesses, but we've done it fairly yeah. and with good governance to ensure that that nothing gets uh, lost and stolen. Absolutely. Look, Ricardo, I mean, you know, we've been, there's the, the constant theme that's been coming up around the election. And of course, we can't ignore it because people are sitting at home and they say, well, I want to live under, I mean, you talk about all these amazing things about how we've invested in, 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 in people and we can keep investing in people. If people are saying, look, we, I want to live under a day government where I can get these opportunities. I mean, then what's the message to them? I mean, you know. Well, the message to them is to vote DA. Mm. I mean, a practical example is in another province uh, run under the ANC, a uh, big business, uh, Clover, is shutting down the factory. Yeah. And they're not shutting down the factory because the there's North no West, money. Hey. Yes. Yeah. And they're not shutting down the factory because there's no business. They're shutting down the factory because of bad governance. Sure. Pure infrastructure, municipality not investing, obviously uh, corruption and, and bad service delivery. Mm. And I can tell you now, there's already discussions underway to move that factory to a province where it's governed well. And yeah. Cape Town is obviously the destination of choice. Yeah. And on that, uh, uh, three weeks ago Sunday, there was a massive animal sanctuary, which was actually tracked via social media, that moved to Mossel Bay in the Western Cape, which is the best run municipality in the country. Mm. And the reasons they've chosen the Western Cape is for the exact same reasons. Mm. Good governance, a government that's responsive, a government that provides electricity and water on time, obviously subject to load shedding. Yeah. But that's what the Western... And they've chosen Mossel Bay as a destination of choice. Yeah. And there was a massive convoy of animals and a sanctuary moving yeah. to the Western Cape to a DA-led province. So for anybody that's going to make that choice on the 27th of October, vote where you're likely to get a job and that's in DA run municipality. Absolutely. I mean what an indictment Ricardo on the on the on the issue that you've just raised about about this clover factory. I mean what a, I mean that is possibly thousands of jobs being lost because government failed to do what is the one job yeah. that they've been asked to do. So you know, there is 330 direct jobs. Oh my God. But as you can imagine the indirect jobs mm. one person look after five uh, people in the family. Mm. So there is you know, thousands of people will be affected. Mm. The municipality will lose income because of that. Mm. But though where we govern well, we're happy to accept those businesses. Absolutely. As we showed in Mossel Bay three weeks ago. Absolutely. And ultimately, I mean, as we were saying with uh, with Tammy and, and Avron, you know, these are not just statistics. These are not just 300 people. These are lives and these are families that are going to be impacted by this kind of poor uh, governance. Yeah, the, the families will be affected. And remember, once a family member become unemployed, they now have to go in the social system. Mm. We're talking about the dignity of people, yeah. the well-being of people. People yeah. have to go stand in a queue. A father or mother that used to work and earn an income will now have to wake up to go stand in the queue with social development. So you're affecting the dignity mm. of people. You imagine the indignation yeah. somebody must suffer from having worked for 15, 20 years. Mm. Now suddenly you have to wake up and go stand in a queue for 350 and social grant. Sure. That is the effect of bad governance. Absolutely. And Ricardo, I, I mean, I do want to thank you for the work that, you know, you and your colleagues are doing as, you know, providing oversight of our governments because you are still hard on them to say, to demand better, to say that, you know, you are entrusted with public money, do better, deliver better, make sure no public money goes missing. And as you say, zero of that money has now been identified as the SIU. So continue doing that work because it's what we've been entrusted to do. Yeah. No, that's what we do. And in fact, uh, I must put it on record, uh, three weeks, four weeks after the pandemic started, we were the first parliament yes. to start Zoom meetings. We were the first parliament, and still the only parliament, not in the country, but in Africa, who had a 
Pacific Committee, the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19, yes. where we invite the Premier, our Minister, the Dr. Noma French, the HOD, Dr. Kluter, come there every week and come and account to our Parliament what's happening on COVID-19, how they spend billions of rands of taxpayers' money on PPE, on vaccination site. We visit these vaccination sites, we visit the hospitals to ensure our government is being held accountable yeah. something they don't do in other provinces absolutely yeah. absolutely and uh, and 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 on that i just you know it it just shows you that how working whether it's from an executive arm to the legislative arm that we just want to get things done and we want to get things done well so we thank you very so. much for joining us we'll be back after okay. this This week, the DA was first out the blocks by putting up our registration campaign posters across Nelson Mandela Bay. I do want to remind you, don't lose hope. We can turn this mess around, but we have to fire governments that are not serving us and replace them with governments who can. Don't miss out on your chance to vote for change in elections later this year. If we as young people use our right to vote wisely, we can build a very different future for all of us. The first and only voter registration weekend is fast approaching on the 17th and 18th of July. Do not miss this chance to make your voice heard. Check up on your voter registration status at check.da.org.za. Until next time, keep it tidy, Mzansi.